like, that would be nice. It doesn't all gonna be like, look the same. Robert, you going next? You gotta, you gotta I don't know. Should we be closer? Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh there you go, there you go. There you go, love. thing right have you guys heard what happened in oakland about like what like a few months ago before the pandemic california is very expensive um and oakland rent regardless if it's a bad area not that rent is so high that they just have empty houses right there's a bunch of empty houses because the rent's too high no one can afford it in the last decade rent for a one-bedroom apartment in oakland spiked 59 percent in san francisco rent soared 92 percent to afford those prices, a renter must make a minimum of $49 an hour. So there were four four uh, black moms, and they were like, we're just gonna live in one of these houses. They're empty. They said, we're just gonna live here and see what happens as a tactic to say there's a housing crisis here in Oakland. Women are members of a group called Moms for Housing, who say they occupied the vacant home to highlight the Bay Area homeless crisis. We make the speculators. We make the speculators. Mom's house! Mom's house! Mom's house! Joining us now is Sam Singer. He is the spokesperson for Wedgwood Properties, the real estate company that owns that disputed property. This group broke into the company's property and took it over illegally. Stealing someone else's property is simply wrong. Yeah, but Sam, one argument that I've heard from the mothers is, is pretty simple. Housing is a human right. Uh, do you or do Wedgwood Properties not agree with that, that housing is a human right? You know, the women made that plea to the court, and the court said that that wasn't within their purview to make a decision. <laughs> it is very simple. They can get all of their money back if they sell the home to the land trust. And if it's in a trust, it remains permanently affordable in perpetuity forever. And that is the model that the mothers are pushing. Sell homes to the land trust so it will be accessible for working people forever. Guns down! In a pre-dawn raid, heavily armed sheriff's deputies moved in on the vacant home where women and children had been living illegally after a 50-day standoff. I'm trying to leave! I'm trying to leave! 
to keep my kids safe. And you sending me to jail? The community was behind them, right? Because this was the start of a movement. They did this intentionally. Similarly to Rosa Parks sitting on the bus, she didn't just sit there. That was a whole planned thing, a whole planned tactic of a movement it was similar to what happened here. What ended up happening is that their, their local community land trust ended up getting control of the property and then they were allowed to stay there and a part of the community land trust. That was a positive part. Y'all supposed to be like, yay, community land trust saved the day. I'm sorry. Do you know what a land trust is? A land trust. Yes. Land trust. No, I don't know what is a land trust. Tell me what's a land trust. Kibbutzim, the Hebrew word for gathering, have been around for over a hundred years, with the first one founded in 1910. The original concept of the kibbutz was to form a utopian community founded on socialist principles that wealth should be owned and controlled by the community. A kibbutz provided its members free housing and basic living essentials, ranging from healthcare, education, childcare, food and utilities, in return for labour within the kibbutz. The goal was to make it a self-sufficient commune. There's a trip in June of 1968. Remember, Martin Luther King is killed in April. In June, eight people go to Israel to begin to study communal ownership of land to figure out how do we gain control of land in a communal fashion. It's probably impossible for individual tenant farmers in the South to do that, but what if they could do it collectively? You would own your home, but you would lease the land underneath your home. So that's the main idea that we brought back the Southwest Judge, more cooperative living, cooperative buying, cooperative selling, cooperative, just about everything cooperative. Again, the community land trust model actually comes out of the civil rights movement um, in Albany, Georgia in 1961. There are leaders in Albany, uh, Slater King being one of them. And Slater and his brother, C.B. King, um, are leaders in the Albany community and they are cousins of the famous Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Slater King um, was very much involved. He was the brother of C.B. King, who was the only black lawyer. Slater was the only black real estate agent. C.B. King, uh, Slater's brother, um, is attacked, jailed, beaten. Slater King's wife, Marion, uh, she actually goes to one of the outlying counties to uh, visit the protesters who've been jailed there, and she is beaten on the street. At the time she's pregnant, she loses their unborn child. That is the kind of terrible oppression that is going on. So when these people arrive at this community land trust model, they're doing so out of necessity. Do you know what a land trust is? Yes, Broome County Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that gives us affordable housing within our community that stays within affordable housing for over 99 years once it's purchased. Uh, do you know what a land trust is? No. Okay, a land trust is a community control over housing. It's a nonprofit organization that uh, makes it so that. So my, uh, I'm learning more about land trusts um, every day. What do you think of land trusts? I am learning about land trusts and I like this idea of land trusts for various reasons. You, oh, yeah. So do you know what a land trust is? Um, yes, yeah, so I heard a, a little bit about the land trust and I heard that um, people in Broome County wanted to start one, which is an awesome idea because if you get a land trust, pretty much the people the community is kind of in charge of it. From my understanding of what a land trust is, uh, it provides accessible or affordable housing for people where they can own their own home. And I, I feel like that's one of the ways that we can combat systemic poverty because if someone owns their home, that can create intergenerational wealth. I like the idea of making home ownership affordable and a, a good educational opportunity for people who haven't had that opportunity before without paying the hundred percent or actually you know when you're talking about um, getting bank loans you're really talking about 
three times the value that you're paying because mm. although you're buying a hundred thousand dollar house you may end up spending three hundred thousand on your mortgage mm. so by doing the land trust we're at least cutting those costs in half and we're also giving people an opportunity to uh, make an equity um, investment uh, community land trust is a nonprofit organization that uh, buys up properties and either rents them out or sells them and keeps them affordable forever. Traditionally, housing is seen as um, a profit-making enterprise, a commodity. Which means that the first of every single month, the tenants are basically paying off a total of $7,724 with me doing absolutely nothing. Well, do you ever try to force appreciation by getting like really good deals in real estate? And how do you find those? 100%. For me, my favorite place to find really good deals is to find someone who is selling, who's selling at what they think is market value according to their rents, but I know their rents are extremely low. So I can buy it because no one else is picking that up. I jump up the rents and so now I'm getting huge returns and I've got into a property that really was below market value even though they didn't know so. Death, we've got divorce, and we've got downsizing. Those are the three reasons why people will sell a $200,000 house for $100,000. If all people care about is profit making, there's always gonna be people left out. You know, it's not profitable to house people who are unable to work, so, and people who have uh, mental health issues, people with disabilities, you know, they're not gonna generate as much profit in the housing market, so there really needs to be um, part of the system set up to where there's no profit motive. Landlords are only in it to get money. And I feel like if you're in something to get money and let's say the tenant is having a hard problem, a hard time and they can't pay rent, then it comes to issues where a landlord is not fixing certain things in the home because they're not getting paid their rent and that's not fair. Cause it's like, I feel like housing is a basic human right and everybody should own their own home and everybody should have a house to live in. So if we get a land trust, that will be amazing because we'll be able to give a lot of people the opportunity to do that for themselves. Being a landlord isn't a real job. It's an investment and investments can either go up or they can go down and that's that's the gamble you're making just like playing the stock market a lot of times when we talk about households being displaced because a landlord wants to increase the rent or displaced because a building is being sold or condemned and being auctioned the way a land trust can step in is really about sustainability it's about um, community ownership to protect those households that are involved in participating from being displaced and from having others decide what their housing is going to look like for them. Yeah, so we're with the Broome Community Land Trust and it's property bought by the land trust which uh, is held by a board of community members, some experts, and no landlords. Yeah, keeping housing affordable, accessible. Great. That sounds like a fantastic idea. Someone, before I been, was a part of the community land trust, people tried to tell me about it and I didn't get it. And then once I got it, I was like, community owns things and it's affordable, no landlord, that's great. Um, so talking to, to your friends about it, talking to your family and your parents about it, um, talking to anyone in the community about it and understand that this is a thing. And that, I mean, like, if everyone stands together and starts to demand things, similarly to what happened in Oakland, anything is possible. Of course, things haven't always been this way. Capitalism first emerged in Europe where the growing wealth and power of rich landowners, merchants, and financiers gradually began to unravel and displace the existing systems of feudal social relations. Before this, the lands and natural resources needed for human survival were considered a commons, meaning that they weren't actually owned by anyone. Even in the Christian agrarian societies where capitalism first took root, it was widely understood that the earth and the entire bounty of nature belonged to God, and were merely administered by his representatives on earth, the church and the monarchy. Seeing the land, uh, just the land itself, the beauty of the land, the purity of the land, and the acknowledgement that all power comes from the land, and the land comes from God. And that's my ministry. 
is still my ministry. The shift to capitalism was made possible through large-scale commodification. The Great Enclosure began in earnest at the end of the 15th century, as acre upon acre of the British Commons was broken up and commodified into individual parcels of land. This was, incidentally, around the same time that Spanish and Portuguese merchants began their invasion and pillage of the New World. As part of their genocidal colonization of the so-called Americas, European settlers imposed this new system of private land ownership onto indigenous nations with a very different conception of property, one in which people belong to the land, not the other way around. I have the title of Taradaho, a uh, traditional leader of the Haudenosaunee. I'm from uh, the Onondaga Nation, which is a uh, central fire of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We've always been in the area, stretching up into, uh, into Canada, down past Pennsylvania, our, our Aboriginal territory. We have been given three messages uh, from the Creator for our people. And the first was given to us as our ceremonies, and how we were to give thanks for uh, all the things that we have, and to be respect and appreciate those things. We got away from that, and the people start warring, just devastating the, uh, our people in all our territories. We needed another message, the message from the peacemaker. He sent this message to this you know, person to bring peace and to form the Confederacy, to come together as a unified government and give us some ways to conduct ourselves and to elect leaders and to create this balance amongst our people. Why is that important to us here in Broome County area? Because their base camp in the southern area was at Ottaquaga in present-day town of Windsor along Route 79. And Joseph Brandt, a Mohawk, who was the last leader of the Iroquois Confederacy, used that as his base of operation during the American Revolution. 1779, the Sullivan Clinton campaign came through this entire area pushing the Native Americans off their own soils under orders of General George Washington. Probably one of the most famous of these sort of anti-Indian campaigns was conducted by General Sullivan. He marched north along the Susquehanna River Valley in Pennsylvania into what is now New York and systematically destroyed all the Iroquois habitations in that part of the country. By the end of his expedition, Sullivan had destroyed over 40 Indian villages and broken the political alliance known as the Iroquois Confederacy. And then the third message was back in 1799, where one of our leaders got a message as to how we were to continue as a people with our white brothers and how do we maintain who we are and our languages and our, our ways and our ceremonies to continue that, even though we're having this conflict in our lands and our people. That was the, um, the last message that's pretty much uh, helped us survive this today. So we're, we're here, we're still here, uh, whether whether we're recognized or not. We, we are a people, we have our language, we have our ways, we have our land, what little land we have left. And it's important as a, uh, you talk about human rights, you know, that's, that's a human right that everybody has to have their own, to, uh, to be able to identify themselves as who they are. The throughway and the road building program that goes hand in hand with it will greatly benefit Binghamton and all the cities of the southern tier tomorrow. And think what better highways made possible by state highway funds the throughway releases will mean to Binghamton Industries, industries like IBM and Endicott Johnson, which contribute so much to the area's $160 million a year of manufactured products. Industries such as ANSCO and all of the more than 360 plants in the area employing some 120,000 workers. A throughway that will bring Binghamton and its people a greater tomorrow.
Local municipalities were particularly eager to build highways under this plan because 90% of funding came from the federal government and the other 10% from states. There's also a darker side to the reason why all these planners wanted to build highways through downtowns and urban neighborhoods. Highways not only paved the way for more and more white people to move into homogenous suburbs, they also provided cover for targeted demolitions inside the city. During that era, federal policies and implicit priorities of planners dictated that you had, you know, vibrant, dense downtown neighborhoods filled mostly with African-American residents. Instead of being preserved under the plan, they were slated as targets for removal. They were considered blight. 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 During the 1960s, these northern urban communities experienced increasing unrest. The ghettos that had been created by federal policy began to combust. From 1965 until 1968, more than 100 northern cities burst into flames. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. Then Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. shot on the balcony of a Memphis hotel and cities across the nation burst out in rioting as distraught African Americans in ghetto communities take to the streets. Tanks are rolling across American cities, army combat troops are in the capital, and Congress is being guarded by the National Guard for fear that some of the rioters in ghetto neighborhoods just feet from the capital will come there. It is in that atmosphere that this nation was finally able to pass the Fair Housing Act. With the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968, the federal government made such practices illegal. But only after years of implementing policies that had enforced discrimination and segregation in housing. The 1968 Fair Housing Act was a response to redlining, a racist lending practice where the federal government colored minority neighborhoods red on maps, labeling them hazardous to lend in. This is where we really prepare. Riot Act, out here we show no fear. Riot Act, time to protect our communities. Riot Act, real criminals get immunity. Riot Act, eye for an eye, so yo, who want it? Riot Act, rushing all you cowards who front it. Riot Act, let's bring the power to the people. Riot Act. Refusing to insure mortgages was creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. What would happen is if there were a few blacks on the block, the federal government says, we're not going to insure our mortgages here because property values might decline. Now, people can't get a mortgage to buy properties on the block, so property values do decline. Nationwide, African-American incomes are on average about 60% of white incomes. African-American wealth today is 10% of white wealth. That enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy practiced in the mid-20th century that has never been remedied. It's a constitutional violation, and of course it determines the ongoing racial inequalities we have today. The gap between white and black ownership is wider now than it was in 1960. Her credit score had plunged 50 points because of a single delinquent electric bill. She paid the bill as soon as Santander flagged it, but the bank still said no. Farul started to suspect this had to do with her race. You know, black people in this country have to be twice as good to get half as much. And I couldn't even get half, you know? They wouldn't give me anything. Turning Farul down because of her race would be illegal. It's been illegal for 50 years. But these laws have not solved the problem. After the 2008 recession, banks tightened their lending standards. Ten years later, while lending has returned for many Americans, Reveal's analysis shows what looks like modern-day redlining is showing up across the country. What would you say to you your idea of the American dream is? 
I'm certain it's extremely separate from the white colonist imperialist view of the American dream. Like my American dream is communities working together, like all the organizations we have here, like the food rescue and Chow and everybody like working together to build their community up, talking to neighbors, not cops, you know, running your community at the grassroots level and everybody having exactly what they need. Do you think that do you think that there's a connection between schooling and housing? Absolutely. What I can say is you you see more investment in the success of the student in on average um, areas where there is more home ownership and again higher tax rates typically. Um, but that also looks at other things. Remember, the social determinants of health look at your overall well-being and then it ties to your ability to advocate. But if I work a job where I have no voice to change my shift to go to the school board meeting, then my voice isn't heard necessarily. And it's kind of a, a, a snowball cycle where if you have a school that's not well-funded, then you have people who have mobility and who have choice on where they live, they're not going to choose that neighborhood. When I lived over um, in Saratoga, the only schooling over there was Benjamin Franklin. And at the time, it wasn't the right education for me. So we moved downtown to go to different schooling, which we went to, I went to MacArthur, which was better schooling. And um, I learned more there. Because I went to Coolidge, and I loved that school. It was really nice. It was very supportive. And then I went to East. And it wasn't bad by any means, but you could tell the difference between that school and West just by stories people tell you. Living on the East Side, I did. But like now that I live on the West Side, you know, it's like the little preppy kids over there. So like the education was pretty decent, but like different than East, so yeah. Living on the West Side, it definitely helps that like West has a bus, elementary schools like Wilson has a bus, and I'm super close to the high school. So I'd definitely say it's better for me than, I'd say I'm privileged, I guess. But like with busing issues, they separate a race to different buses. So it sometimes take longer for one bus to come, which leads to you being late to school and not getting that healthy breakfast. Being over here, even with school, um, you got kids over here at Horace Mann have to walk to school. Little kids, kindergarten. Yes. Walk to school in the cold, zero below. If they want to go and get an education, they have to get dressed and walk to school, which is not fair because a block over, they get bus. And it's one block difference that can make a difference whether you're in a good neighborhood or in a bad neighborhood. If your kids can get bus to school, if they have to walk to school, the struggles are, it, it's not fair. Everybody should be the same across the board. If one kid's there, a little bit black away or getting bus, all the kids in that neighborhood should get bus. So you think transportation is also a big problem? Yes. Yeah, the, the transportation system out here and the cabin system, Horrible, horrible. Let me tell you that right now. Uh, do you take public transportation? No. Because there is none. The public transportation up here sucks. And why do you say that? Because they don't run. 
<laughs> you be standing here for an hour waiting for a bus that, to take a ride that only should be 15 minutes and you done took you an hour because it ain't come for that next hour. Uh-huh. Uh, um, no, be this, it's as bad. And I remember the biggest um, frustration when I didn't have my own car using public transit was going grocery shopping because I was limited in how many groceries I could carry on the bus. And I remember one time I was on the bus and I, I bought too many groceries <laughs> and I dropped one of my bags and all my groceries just like rolled down the aisle. Well, in the COVID right now, if the bus has too many people on it, I'll wait. Okay. Or I'll walk. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, first of all, the bus drivers uh, need uh, classes and respect. That they need to have more buses running so that there's not too many people on the bus at one time and that there's no chance of the people getting affected. So if you have an extra bus or two running on that same line, maybe that'll make it easier and then people won't get sick. Because I don't know if they disinfecting the bus every, every time they roll into the junction. It's horrible on the bus, how they talk to people and, and all that and, and treat people. And they stop running at a certain time. If you got a job that works past five o'clock, you have no transportation to get home. Right. No. I think some of the times they run don't make sense. Like. The buses on weekends, forget about it. It's like they don't think anybody works early in the morning or late on weekends, so they just run for what feels like four hours a day, which doesn't help anybody. Now, the um, cabin system for the cabs, courtesy, and oh, any cab service out here, hey, they are horrible. <clears throat> they tell you to call an hour in advance. You call an hour in advance, they still come. 45 minutes late, they're not consistent, and the name doesn't suit the company because you gotta have courtesy to your customers and you don't. So if you don't have a car like I do, you're only open until nine o'clock at night, that's the last bus. If I can't get out nine o'clock at night, then my kids up. So Binghamton is trying to work on increasing the stops and increasing the access because you know we can't walk to the grocery store. We have to have a method to get to the grocery store or we will have to rely on corner stores which don't have vegetables and fruits necessarily. Um, so that's essential to, again, ensuring the well-being of the community. The closest supermarket from here is Waste and that's over three miles away. I got the GPS, I checked it. I tried to walk it, yeah. And I got a bad knee, so handicapped, people that handicap, you're stuck. I've heard from people who don't have cars that the farmer's market is difficult to get to. Um, there's only, I think there's one bus that goes that way and on the weekends they don't run as frequently. Uh, they put a little convenience store right here across the street, which was a blessing in some ways, but they close at nine o'clock. What you gonna do after 10 o'clock if you need something from the store? Right. If you don't get it before the sun come down, you're not getting it. At all. So the issues of food insecurity and housing insecurity are completely connected. Um, the same economic issues that make a person, uh, that make it difficult for a person to be able to buy fresh food, also then can make it challenging for them to afford quality, safe housing. Um, and we see that a lot with the folks who are members of our programs, um, that they are often making very difficult choices of which bills to pay every month. It's not a matter of learning how to budget better. There's just simply not enough to afford to live with in the climate that we have today. And that is, that is a decision that they should not have to make. These are decisions they should not have to make. It is an unjust system. Um, and we hope that by helping make easier for them to afford healthy food that they can put more resources into other um, aspects of their lives, uh, housing, medical um, needs, etc. But until we address the overarching system that has put people in this place, we will have food insecurity, we will have housing insecurity. 
What causes homelessness in general? The main cause is uh, housing affordability. Um, there are, like I said, a number of factors. So we do often see, aside from income and simply not being able to afford a roof over their head, we do have a number of individuals who we would call chronically homeless, where they have a particular challenge, whether it's a behavioral health um, or physical health disability that keeps them from being able to obtain or maintain employment. And then again, that goes back to income. Um, but the vast majority of folks that experience homelessness locally um, experience it because they can't afford housing. Right. Our society, the way that we function, accepts homelessness. Because we know that there, there are cities out in Arizona and California that people can't live in so bad that they live in the outskirts in, in tents in their own little towns. There are blocks and blocks of homeless people. And we know that and we demonize that and we accept it, which is not right. More than anything else, homelessness is a housing issue. So while there are a number of factors that are involved that can be pervasive, primarily it's simply that someone cannot find a home that they can afford for themselves in their household. So the number one thing we can do locally is prioritize rental housing for the lowest income households in Binghamton and we'll see a reduction in homelessness. Yeah, it got quite cold last night. That's why I didn't get much sleep because my feet were so cold they hurt so I couldn't get comfortable to go to sleep between my feet and my hands. And they have Department of Social Services here, but it takes 45 days for them to even think about doing anything. And if you don't have an address, they won't even talk to you. Particularly in Binghamton, we've seen an increase in the number of families who are experiencing homelessness. Um, but we know that in 2018, we had over 1,500 individuals who accessed shelter. They put me up in a shelter and they said that I didn't re respond back to them, which was a lie. And so they put me on the street for 30 days. So I'm out on the street for 30 days. Any given night we see um, just around 100 individuals who are homeless in Broome County, whether it's in shelter, we've got about two dozen who are unsheltered, typically on any given night. I think one of the one of the stats that I share every chance that I can get is uh, for every 100 extremely low income households that we have locally, we only have 18 available affordable rental units. So when you consider that we have an incredible deficit of affordable housing that's available for these vulnerable families, that again needs to be the priority moving forward. Everybody deserves to live in a nice, safe place that they can afford and that they're happy and that their quality of life is good and that the community has a say and control over what that looks like, right? How has gentrification affected you? Hmm, that's another really good question. Driving gentrification, I would say, was majorly student housing because um, parents from elsewhere can see an opportunity where they can save a little money on their kids' um, tuition by buying a house, having the kid rent it out to their friends, and um, so that's a competition where, in a way, we're, we're competing with downstate. Um, at prices that we don't really um, can't justify by the economic situation here. Whew. Binghamton is turning into a college town. They are taking most of these homes and stuff and making them for college students. Should they use for the homeless? Absolutely. The way it's ran now, you know, they, it's all about the dollar, sorry to say. You know what I'm saying? The homeless they ain't got money. These young kids got the money. So they get the goal first. Sad to say. And it's not just student housing, it's just breaking down the house in general for a more profit. Um, it really does, it. it's just taking a home from somebody who could afford it. And because now you can have, you have five bedrooms and you're gonna make $3,000 versus the $900 that you would have made from a working family being in there. People come to me who are working and can afford about 700 a month for rent and they have to compete against students. So I try to rent a decent house or apartment depending on where it was. It was very difficult. I had one landlord ask for my CV to determine if I was a credible 
renter. I know we're talking about Binghamton, but in Johnson City, they put the School of Pharmacy and then they put, they were encouraging a lot of new businesses that didn't necessarily benefit the residents or include the residents that were housed there. In fact, some were displaced. You can renew a part of the community, but also include the residents and those that are invested. Mm -hmm. So teach me how to open a business so that I can be one of the new businesses that help reshape and shift the community. Huh? We want the black owned businesses up here to spread their businesses, actually buy a store. Stop working out of your trunk. Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> I was getting hyped just now. <laughs>Public records show that from December through April, LMPD officers repeatedly hit 2424 Elliott Avenue, one of the properties targeted on the night of Breonna Taylor's death. They made arrests for drugs, firearms, or trafficking, and the homeowner was sent public nuisance notices. Eventually, he received an order to vacate. In June, he donated the property to the city for $1. So whatever the initial intentions behind PBI, their investigation on Elliott does appear to have helped the city acquire more property on the block. What did your dream home look like? Um, I don't know, just like something nice but modest. I mean, I've never really fantasized like the whole American dream homeowner stuff like that much, but 
I guess, I mean, maybe not even a home. I think an apartment might be nice, like in a city. Okay. All right. Thank you. Oh. Anything else? Be a large house, just like not too to the side where I'm like completely excluded from society, but I want like a bit of like land, I guess to myself and then just good schools and a good community that I can rely on around me. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know. I I just want I don't want to live in like an apartment. I want to live in a house. You know what I'm trying to say? So like I don't want like too many rooms. I probably want like Four bedroom. I want like, you know, like lavish. So yeah, more modern. That's actually a good question. Where do I want to live? Like, like what type of community do you want to live in? Oh, not like a bougie community, but like not like a ill community. So in the middle. Uh, living in an affordable house, you know, um, not somewhere where the police is always around. I wouldn't say suburbs, because I feel like I can't live in a suburb just because that's me, like, personally. But, like, yeah, a nice, affordable home. I want to live in the woods. Like, uh, uh, my dream community. It's somewhere very small, like not many people. I don't want to live around a lot of people. I don't want to live near people. I like to live in like secluded area of the woods, a nice hill that I just by myself in the mountains with the beach nearby. But small community, but I have like the ability to go to like a store once in a while and like get like emergency candy bars if I want comfort food or something. I'm a city person, so somewhere in the city, um, the house doesn't have to be too big. Maybe when I'm older it could be bigger, but as of right now, I'd, I like an apartment with a couple of bedrooms, a decent size, but it has to be in a city somewhere, and very modern. And um, I'd like it to be with everybody together, and like it have like some equality here and make it fair for me to get a house like that because I feel like um, race does play a big part in whether I can get a nicer house or a poorer house. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. No, thank you. What is your dream community in your mind? Or... Like a dream community or like a... One that you'd love to live in someday? Or... Oh, okay, like a dream place I would like to live in would definitely be somewhere that, um is has a lot of like space like acreage um a big house with like a good decent amount of rooms not that many but um just a bigger house for more space and um yeah i just like more like big space and acreage so we can do stuff with like the land maybe farm not farm but like just have some space is that it
So who wants to break the news? Uh oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Did it not film? Um, the mic was ringing. Uh -oh. So I picked up no audio. Okay. Yeah, the schooling has been, oh, I messed that up. <laughs> Cut that out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you put your snacks down? <laughs> Shit. I, wait, should I talk into this? You don't have to hold it, it'll pick it up. Maybe that'll make it easier and then people won't get sick. Because I don't know if they disinfecting the bus every every time they roll into the junction. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> I'm trying to help the community. <laughs> Spread out a little bit. Y'all so close to each other. It was a blue bird in a moon. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yo. 